We become so desensitized to abortion that we forget what it really is. We don't speak of it in terms of a Holocaust, but that's what it is. I hope it can be done peacefully. I hope it can be done in a fair way that everyone can participate in the experience. What is the experience? The annihilation of the world population, reducing it by a minimum of six billion people, according to Dr. Dennis Meadows. This is central to World Economic Forum thinking, and that is also influencing what's going on in the United States. Punt on this issue? No. Now this was, to, I don't know who took this video, whoever he is, I'm very grateful for him uh, because he's exposing a lot of the evil, but here he is, he's, he's videoing right outside an abortion clinic and this abortion doctor comes up to talk to him. Let's, let's listen to this. Friends, I pray, sir, you gotta repent, sir. You gotta repent, sir, for murdering babies. Why? Because it's a sin before God. Why? Well. Stinky breath. Yeah, Why? that's pretty. That's pretty evil of you, sir. Yeah, I am. And, and I hope and pray that you. Yeah. Ha. Well, that's what you do to babies, huh? Yeah, I love it. You love it, huh? Yeah, I do. Okay, I hope that you come to Christ, sir. Oh, I'd never go to Christ. I hope that you come to Christ. No, sir. I don't go to Christ. Yeah, you. I don't you, listen to Christ. You, you will have a darkened heart, sir. I do have a darkened yeah. heart. Yeah. You have a darkened heart. I do. I do very, very much. And so. you will stand yeah. before God in judgment. Yes, day, I will. Day. Every day. You will stand before God in judgment. Yes, day. I will. Every day. All of the babies that I you have killed. I love it. I love it. Yeah, keep tearing the babies. Yeah, apart. I will. Keep tearing the babies. I apart. will. Keep keep tearing the babies apart. Yeah, sir. The babies, their blood screams from the ground. It's an astonishing video. It's a disturbing video. Here is this abortion doctor, not ashamed, not at all. He's celebrating the murdering of unborn children. <clears throat> I love it, he says, in a voice that sounds demonic i never go to christ i have a darkened heart this is what he says this is like something out of a um out of a horror movie except it's far worse than a horror movie because horror movies are fake i mean they're they're made up stories we make up stories about you know the is it jason who wears the hockey mask you know comes after everybody freddy krueger with his with his um um knife fingers or you know whatever it is maybe i'm confusing him with edward scissors hands but anyway these kind of evil characters this is a real life evil character celebrating celebrating his own dark heart and the murdering of unborn children now the reason i want to talk about abortion today most of you already are very decided on this issue i'm not trying to persuade you as to what you should or shouldn't believe on that issue. If it's not clear to you already, I'm probably not gonna make much of a dent there. Rather, what I wanna focus on is the ideas that are driving the Republican Party. Again, this is ideas have consequences. And <clears throat> abortion, pro-life, has been a core principle of the Republican Party for decades since Roe v. Wade um, was uh, became law in 1973. And it has remained a, a core tenant all of these decades. But now, now you have a debate over whether or not, whether or not Republicans should ditch abortion as a central tenant maybe we just need to get rid of it maybe this is an issue we can't win on and this is because it is argued that it is an issue that is leading to um, democrats sweeping uh, governor seats and um, state um, representative um, chairs uh, sweeping um, congress this kind of thing and so you have an individual like ann coulter and i want to be clear that i like ann coulter but she tweeted this and it's just shocking to me 
pro-lifers are going to wipe out the Republican Party. In addition to losing Ohio Tuesday night, Governor Glenn Youngkin lost big in Virginia because of pro-life zealots. A 15-week abortion limit would have been fine with Virginia voters, but Republicans couldn't promise to stop there without risking a primary challenge from full-ban pro-lifers. My number one compromise position still stands. Make abortion illegal only for registered Republicans. In all fairness to Ann Coulter, she's not saying that she is, you know, pro-abortion. She's, she's a pro-lifer. What she's arguing is, again, pragmatism. She is saying, yeah, we'll remain, we'll, we'll remain a pro-life party, but let's, let's tone it down. Let's Let's soften our demands. Let's, let's back off of this issue just a little bit and, and, and not make it central to who we are. The Republican Party of Lincoln's Day. The Republican Party of Lincoln's Day was dealing with a very similar issue, and that was slavery. And it was fracturing the Republican Party. Um, because there were those who said, look... Uh, slavery is the law of the land in uh, many of the states within the union. Uh, we don't want to fracture our party. We want to be able to work with Democrats, you know, across the aisle. This, this is going to lead to a, a massive fracture in our country. Let's back off of this issue just a little bit. Let's not make, they, they argued what Ann Coulter is effectively arguing here. But there were those, the abolitionists, who were very staunch and very clear about who they were morally and said, no, absolutely not. This cannot be allowed to stand. And if it comes to war, then let it come. Whatever comes, let it come because the enslaving of human beings cannot be allowed within this union. Who are we as a nation if we're allowing this kind of stuff? And that, I think, is where we need to be as people. It's where we need to be as conservatives, whether you're Republican or not. Um, but it is where we need to be as individuals. It's where we certainly where you need to be if you are a Christian. We're not pragmatic in our moral, our moral outlook. We're very clear about who we are. And by the way, moral certainty gives other people confidence. It does. It carries the day. And we're allowing, we're allowing the cultural left, not just Democrats in this country, but the cultural left globally to act like they have the moral high ground on issues ranging from depopulation to immigration to homosexuality, the alphabet mafia agenda, you name it. They're acting like they have the moral high ground. They are the very definition of evil. The very definition of evil. And we need to recapture the spirit, the moral certainty and fortitude of a party that in 1860 said, no, no. We're not going to remain buddies with people who are of this view. We are not, we, if it fractures the party, it fractures the party. If it fractures the country, it fractures the country. Let what come, come. Because we're going to stand on this issue. Listen, the Republican Party has already punted on, on um, economic conservatism. They've all long ago have given up on that issue. So I'm just not really clear on what would be left. We've given up on, on the alphabet mafia agenda. On, I mean, there would be nothing left of conservatism. So we need to be very clear about who we are as a people. Everyone's going to encounter pain in their life. The questions deal with the degree of one's pain and the source of one's pain and how we deal with our pain. In this course, I'm speaking very personally about my own pain and some of the lessons that I've learned in coping with pain, how we minister to people with pain, and what kind of perspective are we to have 
on the big questions that surround pain and human suffering. Why would you take a course like this? Well, presumably, if you haven't suffered in your own life, you will encounter people who do. And undoubtedly, some of them are people who are very near and dear to you. I think it'd be very helpful for you to take a course like this in order to understand what they're experiencing and the way that you minister to people in those kinds of circumstances. So I'd love for you to take this course of mine. And I want to tell you this, that when you subscribe to Tome, you get access not just to my course, but to more than a hundred other courses that are dealing with very practical issues and assisting you in living and in flourishing. So where can you get this course? Well, you can't get it at Amazon. You can't get it at Apple. You can't get it at Netflix. You can only get it at Tome. So I want you to go to tomeapp.com slash pain to learn more about my course. Let's get back to the podcast. Now, what happened in Ohio? Well, this is what happened in Ohio. Abortion is health care. And abortion access is the law of the land in Ohio. This is just a little side note, and there will be some people who think I'm being mean when I say this, but I actually think it's noteworthy from the point of view of who's driving this. Have you noticed that many of the people who are driving, not all of them, but many of the people who are pushing the feminist agenda, the radical feminist agenda, the LGBTQ alphabet mafia agenda, um, abortion, that they're often fat and unattractive. It's startling to me how frequently that's the case. People who you're thinking, I mean, what is the likelihood she's going to get pregnant? And some of you are going to say, Larry, that's so mean. That's so cruel to say something like that. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be cruel. I, rather, I'm making a sociological observation here that frequently these are individuals, in my view, this is a theory. I haven't, haven't done a great big study on this. But in my experience, which is considerable at dealing with these kinds of individuals, that they are often people who hate attractive, happy women who are happy as mothers, they're happy as wives, uh, they're happy as women. They're just comfortable as being women. And people, people who are like that are often hated by those individuals who for one reason or another feel disenfranchised. They feel like they can't be a part of that crowd, so they're going to go in the absolute other direction um, in order to be, you know, Gilbert Hyatt wrote a brilliant little book years ago. He was a Columbia classicist in which he was talking about the, um, the interesting pattern that we see in monarchies of great kings being followed by mediocre kings and then a great king and a mediocre king and a great king and a mediocre king in his theory which is interesting is that frequently sons feeling they could not measure up to the greatness of their fathers decided that they would go in the other direction and become characters instead they would become they would become the villain they would become the outlaw uh, instead of trying to um to live up to something they felt like they couldn't live up to and where they felt they were always in the shadow they were always going to be you know second fiddle to the image of their fathers so they became something completely different i think that same kind of phenomenon is at work here in a lot of these kinds of women who hate pretty women, they hate ha happy women, they hate mothers, they hate wives, and do you know who, happy wives, and do you know who they hate most of all? Children. Children. And that comes out in this. Here you have this woman, she's celebrating this, like this is a great moral victory. It isn't a great moral victory. And Ann Coulter is saying, hey, let's just punt. Let's just punt on this issue and give them what they want. No, no, let's don't give them what they want. Let's expose them for who they are. These are individuals who are talking about killing babies. They're the abortion clinic doctor. Do we want to give grounds to people like that? That's Joseph Mengele right there in that video. 
and I think this is extremely important to point this out, abortion, even for the likes of an Ann Coulter, has become, we become so desensitized to abortion that we forget what it really is. We don't speak of it in terms of a Holocaust, but that's what it is. We don't speak of it in, the, in terms of murder, but that's what it is. We don't speak of it in terms of slaughter of innocents, but that's what it is. If this were 1933 Germany and we had a political party that was running, would we say, let's just kind of punt on anti-Semitism. Let's, let's, just, let's just not make that part of our platform. Let's, let's let the Nazis, the fascists have what they want in regards to that. The killing of Jews, I mean, come on. Uh, it's just really not that big a deal. And by the way, Ann Coulter is pro-life. I'm not just trying to trash her here, but I am saying that that kind of opinion is dangerous because what's left? What are we saying when we're done with it? What, what is our party actually about? What kind of moral standards do, are we actually left with if we take the position that Ann Coulter is advocating here? Well, we're not pro-life anymore. I mean, aren't we just basically Democrats after that? Isn't that what we're left with? I loved what the Babylon Bee tweeted. Just brilliant. Babies alive because of Dobbs ruling apologize, the Supreme Court ruling that that knocked down um, after decades uh, Roe v. Wade. Babies alive because of Dobbs ruling apologize to Republicans for making it hard to win elections. <laughs> That's great. Should these should these children apologize? Should we regret that these children are now alive instead of dead? No, we have to have standards. Now, some of you are saying, but Larry, we have to, we have to be realistic. We have, to, we have to win. We have to be, what's the idea? What's the word? What's the term? Pragmatic. Well, I agree that the Republican strategy is awful. I do agree with that. It looks, it looks something like this. I, I decided to, to try to illustrate the problem here. And so I, I went and found a Band-Aid uh, in the medicine cabinet in my house. And I went out and I found, unfortunately, I have a crack in my driveway. And I took this picture. This, this is a perfect image of the Republican strategy. And that's because the Republican Party is increasingly fractured. It is fractured and loosely held together. And um, the, the two groups, the two main groups, are on the one end, evangelicals and social conservatives on the one side. And on the other side, we have rhinos. We have Mitch McConnell's. We have individuals. We have Nikki Haley's. We have uh, Mitt Romney's. We have individuals who are basically Democrats, but fiscal conservatives. That's what they are. They don't really care about these kinds of issues. They're, Ukraine doesn't get them too upset. Uh, they're not terribly upset about what's happening um, in Israel with Hamas. Um, they're individuals for whom government has been a vehicle of self-aggrandizement and self enrichment. That's what government has been for them. They, they, they don't have the, you know, the classic, you know, American view of government that one is a citizen who serves on behalf of the people for a time and then returns home, you know, to the farm, to the homestead. That's not their view. That's not what government is. It's something for their own self aggrandizement, self enrichment and self empowerment and protecting their own fiefdoms. And <clears throat> thus, I agree that the Republican strategy on abortion is deeply flawed, in part because we are a fractured party, but also because I think the strategy is just wrong um, insofar. Let me re rephrase that. It isn't wrong in the moral sense from on, on the pro-life side of the party. It is rather that it is not especially effective insofar as I think that rather than, you know, abandoning abortion, I think we need to go all in on abortion. But we have to get our messaging right. We need to expose who these people are. We need to show these kinds of videos. This, this abortion clinic 
doctor. We need to show who these people really are. If we really think that we can't win on an issue that is so egregiously murderous, immoral, evil, that we can't win the American population over on an issue like that, who are we trying to win over? Who, what, what, what kind of people are we trying to appeal to at that point? What are we left with? I mean, we're left with a country of people who are morally void, and I don't believe that's the case in the United States. But I do think that the Democrats have been very effective in obfuscating the issue and blurring it. You know, some of you will recall, I, 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 I thought this was very interesting when my, when my oldest son was at, uh, at Yale Law, he was telling me, um, you know, dad, we are taught the word he says they would use is to complexify issues. So you take something that's very simple, like abortion. I mean, it's murder. I mean, you are ending a life. That's what it is. And he says, we're taught to complexify it, to obfuscate, to blur the lines, to make it very unclear as to what it is. Now, I want to be, I want to be very clear on this point. My son is a, a very strong um, evangelical Christian, um, a Bible-believing Christian. So he does not buy into to that view at all, but rather he was learning what their strategy was. Uh, he was putting arrows into his own quiver to fire back at them as we hoped, of course, that he would. But he's saying the strategy is to blur everything, to complexify it, so that you don't really feel that you are competent to adjudicate the issue. You need an expert to come in and say, when does life begin? Gosh, I don't know. Oh, this is health care. Did you hear the woman say that? Abortion is health care. They have discovered that is a winning term for them. It's lying. It's 100% lying. But they have learned that that phrase is gaining ground for them. In the same way that in the 90s, the uh, homosexual agenda discovered that if they could pass off gay marriage as a civil right, if they could attach their sordid movement to uh, that of Martin Luther King Jr., that the American people would look the other way because the last thing they wanted to be was against civil rights. They didn't want to be against civil rights. So they decided what we need to do is to bring the homosexual agenda in under the cloak of civil rights. Well, that's what's happening with abortion. Abortion, it's murder. That's what it is. It's murder. But if we can cloak it as health care, what American wants to be seen as being against health care? Or if we can hide it, cloak it under um, right to privacy, if we can cloak it as personal choice, if we can cloak it as a woman's right to her own body, Americans don't want to be against those things. And of course, you're not against any of those things when you're opposed to abortion, unless, again, your morality is nothing more than sentimentality. It's Christian-ish. It's not rooted in eternal principles. It's not rooted in truth. It's not rooted really in anything beyond your own feelings, which are unreliable. <clears throat> if you make major decisions in your life, an interesting study was done. This is maybe about 25 years ago of Cambridge, Cambridge, some of the, the intellectual elites on this planet. Cambridge University students discovered that roughly a half of, half of them made major life choices based on vague inner promptings. Another term for that is their own feelings. 
what you feel on an issue, and your feelings can be manipulated. You know this if you watch um, you know, a skillfully told story that can make you sympathetic with murder. It can make you sympathetic with adultery. It can make you sympathetic with um, heinous crimes because a good storyteller knows how to manipulate your emotions and make you endorse things that are, in fact, evil. And that's why it's extremely important that your feelings um, are not your guide, rather that you're guided by principle. And again, I, I said this in a, in a Twitter thread on great movies that people could watch. Um, one of them is called Judgment at Nuremberg. Watch that film. It's about three hours. Uh, you know, so you have to set aside a little bit of time. It's a, an all-star cast, uh, Spencer Tracy, uh, Maximilian Schell, even a young William Shatner appears in that. Judy Garland, um, Marlena Dietrich, Richard Widmark, numerous others. And the film is about the Nuremberg Trials. It's about the Nuremberg Trials and the brilliant defense attorney for the Nazis who complexifies the issues all the way through. He complexifies the issues brilliantly in his defense of the Nazis so that the judges themselves would be left kind of going, well, you know, I guess we understand why you killed 8 million people. We understand why you burned their bodies and did grotesque experiments and sterilized people. We understand why you loaded them all up onto train cars and sent them on one-way trips to Mauthausen. Auschwitz, Dachau, Middlebaugh, Dora, Sachsenhausen, Ravensbrück, Buchenwald. We understand it's a complex issue. It's hard to adjudicate on this. And I love the words of Spencer Tracy at the very end, which hit like a hammer. And I don't think this is a spoiler, but he basically says what happened here was evil. And nothing on God's green earth can ever make it right. Ladies and gentlemen, abortion is evil. Nothing on God's green earth can ever make it right. No level of clever argument should ever, ever distract you from that truth. Grooming children is evil. Sexualizing children is evil. Marxism is evil. The LGBTQ alphabet mafia agenda is evil. Don't be distracted from those things. Don't buy into this idea that we need to punt on this. Rather, what we need to do is be more clear in articulating why we believe it's evil, why we believe it's wrong, and what the alternatives to this are. I think the American people will respond to that. Did you know that abortion clinics remained open during the pandemic? They remained open. You couldn't go to your job. You couldn't go get groceries. You couldn't go and see your relatives in a hospital, my wife, who was for many years a labor and deliver, delivery nurse, told terrible stories of, I mean, to me, just awful. A woman is giving birth, but the father is not allowed to see his wife or to see the child. They're kept in complete, complete isolation by strangers for weeks without seeing their own child. Those are critical weeks. That's a critical time. Can't go see your, um, your grandparents in a um, uh, assisted living home. Nope, couldn't do that. But abortion clinics, the killing of kids, those factories, they remained, uh, remained open. I have addressed this issue um, many times. First, well, actually, I'm not sure which, which one came first here. I guess the first one was um, in Fox News. I published a piece in 2019. Here's why pro-abortion supporters are so fierce and bullying. Hence, it's not what you think. The pro-abortion crowd, they're haters of God. That's what this is about. That's Romans 1. 
They're haters of God, and it's why they want to rub it in your face. They want to use your tax dollars to kill children because they know that Christians believe that human life is sacred. These are individuals who want to rub it in your face. Now, we all know a little bit about that when it comes to, um, well, let's say something like sports. Your team wins and you rub it in the face of your, you know, of your, your, your buddies. You know, you're a Red Sox fan and you, you beat the Yankees on that rare occasion and, uh, and you want to, you know, celebrate that. But doing it on something like this, that's not a moral issue. Yankees, Red Sox, USC, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, Auburn, fourth and 31. Excuse me, I couldn't resist. Those aren't moral issues. This is a moral issue where somebody's trying to take it and rub it in your face. The abortion doctor comes out and says, yes, I love it. He hates that man who is videoing him. He hates what he represents because he's a hater of God. And he says, you're, you're killing children. He goes, I love it. I love it. That's demonic. That's why they hate it. Then I published a piece just a couple of weeks later in USA Today, abortion, by the way, neither Fox News nor USA Today would publish either one of these today. Abortion advocates hypocritically insult pro-life states for bigotry and ignorance. When you write for publications, you don't get to choose the title of your articles. They, they're determined by something called SEO, search engine optimization. I would never have given it a title quite so um, awkward as this. But anyway, it does capture the title of the piece. And again, I'm saying in both of these articles, that what it comes down to is that this is an area that the left has chosen to plant their flag and to die on this hill because they recognize that it is a key component of not only their political opposition, but of their uh, cultural opposition. They want to destroy the primary tenant of your morality and that's cultural marxism and that's that's because they recognize maybe better than conservatives do that the key tenet of our worldview is a belief in god and belief that man is the object of special creation he's not a he's not a product of random chance and necessity as the you know as evolutionists unbelieve um that is to say, atheistic, purely naturalistic uh, evolutionists would argue that human beings are simply an accident in space and time. They have no purpose. And hence, a human life has no more value than any other animal on the face of the earth. It's what's driving the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum, as I've said many times on this show, and by the way, I will be at the World Economic Forum again um, in just a couple of months, I was there earlier this year in Davos, Switzerland. I'll be there again. Listen, whatever they're telling you, they're also very good at obfuscation. Whatever they say about the planet, about humanity, about food sources, about all these kinds of things, they say it in soft and gentle tones. It seems as though these are people who are do-gooders. They're out looking out for the rest of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the World Economic Forum is a fascist, not Marxist. It is a fascist organization that is about depopulation. Now, they, they carefully hide that agenda in a bunch of other stuff. If you go to their website and watch their videos, their, their videos are all about, in, you know, many of them, most of them are about loads of innocuous things like the celebration of diversity and, oh, here's a video on basket weaving in, in the Andes. And here's a video on cultural, you know, excuse me, um, environmental conservation in, in the Congo, you know, and all these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, they are about they're about depopulation. And in case you've forgotten this, I just want to remind you of it.
Some of you who might be new um, to this program may not be familiar with World Economic Forum agenda contributor and co-author of Limits to Growth, a massively influential leftist environmentalist handbook, Dr. Dennis Meadows. And listen to what Dr. Dennis Meadows says. So far, globally, you are so far above the population and the consumption levels, which can be supported by this planet, that I know in one way or another it's going to come back down. So I don't hope to avoid that. Uh, I hope that it can occur in a, a, a civil way, I, I, and I mean civil in a, in a special way, I, peaceful. Peace doesn't mean uh, that everybody's happy, but it means that conflict isn't solved through violence, through, through force, uh, but rather in other ways. And so uh, that's what I hope for, uh, that we can, I mean, the planet can support something like a billion people. This is key. Maybe two billion, depending on how much liberty and how much material consumption you want to have. If you want more liberty and more consumption, you have to have fewer people. And conversely, you can have more people. I mean, we could even have eight or nine billion, probably, if we have a very strong dictatorship, which is smart. It's, unfortunately, you never have smart dictatorships. They're always stupid. So, but if you had a smart dictatorship, and a low standard of living, you can have it. But, but we want to have freedom and we want to have a high sentence. So we're going to have a billion people. And we're now at seven, so we have to get back down. I hope that this can be slow, relatively slow, and that it can be done in a way which is relatively equal, uh, you know, so that people share uh, the experience and you don't have a few rich, you know, trying to force everybody else to, to deal with it. So those are my hopes. I mean. These are pretty pessimistic hopes, you know, but I mean, that's, that's what lies ahead. So abortion in the United States and Coulter and many others uh, within the Republican Party would say we need to punt on that issue. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a global issue. It is not just an American issue, which is why I want to um, wanted to show you once again, and what we'll show him, we'll show him in future episodes. I, I, I want people to become very aware of this. Isn't just the lunatic fringe here. This, this isn't um, just some guy, you know, who's you know belongs to some weird commune, you know, living out in the middle of on, uh, Montana. This is a World Economic Forum. His title is agenda contributor forming the core of their agenda. And as I say, he is co-author of a book, Limits to Growth, which led to the rise of the creation of the World Economic Forum in the first place. This is central to World Economic Forum thinking, and that is also influencing what's going on in the United States. Punt on this issue? No, absolutely not. This is a hill I will die on, quite willingly die on this issue. I'm trying to think, I, I mean, I do believe in eternal principles and I do believe that someday I have to give an answer to God. And I don't believe that my God has called me to victory per se. He's called me to obedience. And again, there's a difference there. He's called me to adhere to, um, to principles. And guys like this, so I hope it can be done peacefully. I hope it can be done in a fair way that everyone, and this, this is the language that cracks me up cynically, that everyone can participate in the experience. What is the experience? The annihilation of the world population, reducing it by a minimum of 6 billion people, according to Dr. Dennis Meadows. And he really thinks it should be reduced by 7 billion. We have roughly 8 billion people in the world. He thinks there should only be a billion. But hey, we can all experience, share in the experience as we reduce the global population. These are the people who are driving policy in the United States. And if we don't stand against them, what do we stand for? Did B Dietrich Bonhoeffer say, you know, I think anti-Semitism is perhaps an issue 
that we should punt on. You know, maybe we just don't make that big of a deal out of it. Then what's left? Then, you know, what, what are you opposing Hitler for? Aggressive warfare? Well, that's what's, that's what's driving a big part of his policy is to not just kill the Jews in Germany, but to kill them throughout Europe. So you're not going to oppose him on that either. And, I mean, he is making the trains run on time, and he's building beautiful Audubon. So, I mean, you know, maybe we should just all be fascists. Maybe we should all just be saying, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil, and stand there with, with the map. What are we left with? If this is if we punt on an issue like this and ladies and gentlemen, I also want you to be aware of the fact I come back to something I said when we're watching that abortion doctor, this is satanic ritual. This is satanic ritual. This is I'm not sure that that guy and I do believe in demon possession. I'm reminded of what James 219 says, you know, uh, you say you believe well, the demons believe and shudder. There's a great line in a, um, I never saw the film. It was with Keanu Reeves called Constantine. And someone says in the commercial, I don't believe in Satan. And the reply is, it's quite chilling. Well, he believes in you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may say you don't believe in Satan. You don't believe in demons. Well, they believe in you. And if you say, I do believe there is a God, but you haven't really rooted your life in him, well, as James 2.19 says, well, the demons believe in him and they shudder. And they shudder for they know what their end actually is. And until such time, their ritual is the destruction of human life. It is the perversion. Satan isn't creative. All he can do is, is to pervert the things of God. He can uh, pervert love. He can pervert beauty. He can pervert marriage. He can pervert human life. As one biblical commentator put it on Romans chapter one, once you suppress the truth, you will soon um, pervert the truth and eventually you will pervert life itself. And that's where we are is the perversion of, of every aspect of human life. They're haters of God. And hence, these are the kinds of individuals who celebrate the destruction of human life. We must never give up on this issue. Uh, what we must do is be clear what we are for. We must purge um, our churches, our party, of individuals who are not on board with the core agenda, with who we are. We must have a mission statement, and then we must be prepared to articulate it with clarity and to fight for it in the public arena, educating the American people on this issue and everything else. We are allowing the cultural left to define, to redefine terms, to redefine the use of language, to redefine the issues as though they themselves occupy, by default, the moral high ground, which they most certainly do not. But they've been very effective with the steady drip of a lying media of intimidating um, Americans, intimidating conservatives from really adhering to their principles and to fighting on these issues. And so we must expose it. We must expose the truth for what it is. We must be a people who stand for something. And I end with this. A nation that destroys its children, that makes war on its children, as we certainly are, has no regard for its future. But I'll go further than that. A nation that does such things invites the wrath of God.